Yeah. So I would like to propose to switch the places with Professor Osborne. Welcome. And I would like to welcome also the Luma people to listen to this uh, direct sending from uh, Heureka. Mr. Osborne, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we're ahead. OK, great. Fine. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for attending online. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be doing this in person, uh, but uh, I'm uh, delighted that you've come to listen to me, and I hope I've got something valuable to say. The basic title of what I'm talking about uh, is... Wait a minute, okay. okay. Uh, I'm calling it Science Education for a Post-Truth Society. And the, the label post-truth, I think, is being used to reflect that I think we're all confronted by a very rapidly changing society where all kinds of in, uh, we are provided with all kinds of information. Basically, we're awash a in a sea of information. And I think the evidence is pointing to the fact that most of our youth have no basic navigational qualifications. And you could also say that about a lot of adults as well. And the consequence of that is that they are tending to believe all kinds of things uh, which you are dubious, and uh, there is an undermining of the trust in science. And the responsibility for that must, f or remediating for that, must fall on those who are engaged in teaching science and educating people about science, because the failure to do this is to do a disservice to science, and that is, I think, is it's ultimately to do a disservice to the societies in which we live. And I want to make that kind of argument, basically, and talk about what it is that we can do in science, because I think the kinds of things we can do in science education require some kind of rethinking of what we value. So okay, who has been involved in this project? Well, basically, this project was initiated by Bruce Alberts, who used to be the editor of Science. He's a leading member of the science community in um, the U.S., and he basically was worried and concerned, I think, about the way in which science has been called into question, particularly in the recent pandemic with all the issues around vaccines and masks. Uh, and he uh, convened with Janet Coffey from the Moore Foundation, who have funded this work. Uh, uh, well, he asked me to lead a group of people, and this is the list and group of people. It's a mix of people who are engaged in uh, science, philosophy of science, for instance, Douglas Olchin, uh, is a philosopher of science. Uh, I, I, some of them are um, uh, undergraduate science educators. Carl Bergstrom, for instance, has written a book called Calling Bullshit. Uh, Saul Perlmutter is a Nobel Prize winner who's written a book or developed a course called Sense and si Sensibility of Science. And then, of course, in fact, you have Carrie Kivinen, okay, from a fact a Bari in Finland. And there are other people here uh, who are w work in science. And we have met over the uh, past six months, basically, still in ongoing meetings to discuss what the issue is, to look at the different kinds of approaches, and to generate some kind of report. Basically, our goal with this is to generate a kind of policy statement for the science education community, arguing why this matters and why we really have to do something about it. And our kind of model for this is previous reports that have uh, come out of the UK. One of them was by Paul Black. Uh, my colleague on Intercall Inside the Black Box, and another one is the one that I was involved in called Beyond 2000 Science Education for the Future that some people may know about. So our goal in the next three to four months is to produce some kind of similar report as well, uh, arguing the case for why this matters, because we do obviously think that it matters. Now, in making this case, we have uh, drawn on a lot of uh, what you might call ac academic work, uh, these are some of the kinds of articles uh, Douglas Orchin and Dietmar Hotka's work, uh, work on reconceptualizing the nature of science education, Clark Chin and Sarah Basile's work on education for a post-truth world, and the one that Carrie's already mentioned, Anastasia Kosreva and her colleagues on citizens versus the in internet, uh, confronting digital channels with cognitive tools. I think the thing to take note of here is that this in the past four or five years has gained a lot of attention because there is a lot of concern about the, out there about the way in which some of this misinformation is undermining what you might call the, the civil nature of democratic societies. And we start from the premise, and I think this is the important premise, that true knowledge is a collective good. 
because basically it enables us to act in an informed way. And therefore it's tremendously important that people draw on what we call true knowledge in making their decisions and informing their actions. The question to be asked, of course, is how do you make sure that they reliably get that? And we have four questions, really. First of these questions is, why is this competence to evaluate expertise and information needed? Uh, you might say that's obvious, but nevertheless, it's part of our argument. Uh, what is the evidence they actually struggle with that? And I'll come to each of these questions in turn. Okay. Why should science education, and those who are science educators listening to this might think, well, this is fine, but it's not really my concern. It's civics education. Why should science education be bothered about this uh, in that sense? And if it should be bothered, our last question, what can be done in science education to develop the ability to evaluate scientific information? Because much of this misinformation has a scientific quality to it. Uh, and uh, to, to do it competently as well. So those are our questions. Um, so let's uh, turn to the first of these questions. Why is this competence to evaluate expertise and information needed? Okay, well, I don't really think this needs a very strong argument, but this is the kind of way of summarising it. This is the contemporary challenge. You've seen it extremely uh, prominent and coming to the fore in the past two years with the pandemic. All kinds of competing claims in the community and many of these claims calling on the language of science to try and convince people that they uh, basically are, uh, are capable of making the decision for themselves and that they are in, uh, sufficiently informed uh, and the, or that they are being deluded in some kind of way by uh, scientists. So this is the challenge. How do you sort out, in some senses, the wheat from the chaff? How do you make it clear what's trustworthy knowledge and what's unreliable knowledge? And this has been characterized by various reports. This is one of them. Uh, so we are living in an area of truth decay, where truth is less valued than it was. What matters is not so much what you might call objective truth. What matters, in some senses, is what the values and beliefs of the community you have in that sense. Uh, and this has led to the notion of post-truth. So you, out there, you can have, find all kinds of misinformation. This is just a sample of them, for instance. There's still a prominent number, a number of people who believe that the Earth is flat, that ivermectin can cure you or prevent you from getting COVID-19. Moon landing was a hoax. That one's been going on for a long time. Masks are ineffective at preventing the spread of COVID-19 or that climate change is not anthropogenic. And you find that, okay, in all kinds of sources, but particularly this kind of tweets. And some of this, okay, goes beyond what I call misinformation. Um, misinformation is just simply knowledge that's passed on that happens to be wrong. Uh, the people who passed it on didn't know or don't know uh, that it's wrong. But disinformation is spread deliberately uh, for some kind of uh, political or financial agenda in that way uh, for people to make... Uh, uh, profit out of it. And uh, being aware of that distinction, I think, uh, is important. And the situation, I think, in some senses, has got to the point where uh, this cartoon characterises it, the level of concern about it, in that sense, uh, where you can see misinformation as, not, as the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, in that sense, along with war, famine, pestilence, and death. Uh, you might say that's putting it a little bit radically. But the position I think we're in as a group of experts in the community is this is something serious. It is not something that we can pass off and wait to pass. It's something that we have to do something about and not doing something about it okay, is problematic. The question you've got to ask, in fact, then, is what should science do about it? You're in a situation where, in some senses, expertise or the, the value placed on expertise has diminished. This is a very readable book by Tom Nichols, who bemoans this uh, fact, arguing things like, I'm still deeply concerned that we are headed into even darker days for logic, reason and knowledge, and consequently the kind of reason debate that sustains democratic societies. And this is, in some senses, a very, uh, what could you almost say, irony, because actually we're living in societies which are more and more complex, where are dependent on more and more specialist knowledge. 
We are all intellectually dependent on experts. Every time you basically go out there on the road, get on a train, get in a plane, you are dependent on people who know things you do not know that enable that system to run. That's just transport systems. Think about health systems. Think about energy systems. Okay? All of us depend on the experts who run those kinds of systems. And what you're seeing emerging, I think, is a concern about this in a range of books, Science Under Fire by Andrew Jewett, a book by Gloria Arrighi on reputation and how basically people make judgments on the basis of reputation rather than evidence, and Steven Pinker's book on rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce and why it matters. Those are some of them. And the responses to that, in some senses, are books on courses organized by people like Carl Bergstrom, who was a member of our group on calling bullshit, uh, Sam Weinberg, who was also a member of our group, colleague at Stanford on civic online reasoning. Do look them up. They've got, uh, uh, and of course, the, the work done by Fact of Ari on fact checking for educators and future v voters. That's some of the work in that sense. And then there is also a very long and lengthy response published recently by the uh, National Academy of Education on civic reasoning and discourse. They, too, are concerned about it. That's a very academic treatise on it, but it's downloadable, and obviously it goes into this issue in some depth. OK, so that, I think, is a kind of argument for why it is that this is an important issue. Okay. I'll get to the issue of why it matters for science education in a moment. What, uh, briefly, I want to try and answer this kind of question what evidence is there that students struggle to evaluate information successfully? Because I think a lot of us think, well, these young people, they're growing up in this kind of sea of digital media all the time. Every time you get on any piece of public transport or if you're in a family, they seem to be fixated or hooked to this. Surely they're acquiring this expertise en passant or they're learning from each other. Would that it was so. Sadly, that is not the case, because the research evidence is that students are poor at evaluating sources of information. They make what you might call fundamental basic mistakes. They think, for instance, that doc if a site's got doc.org on it, it's a reputable website. I'm sorry, but nothing could be further from the truth. Some dot.orgs are reputable, and some dot.orgs are simply disreputable, and that doesn't help you as a criterion for discriminating. They tend to evaluate the page. So they start by looking and reading the page and seeing what kind of information is it. Uh, and they get duped, many people get duped, into thinking that they are capable of doing that and that they will understand the evidence in that kind of way. This is the wrong thing to do. Expert fact-checkers do not stay long on the page. They open another tab and check out the source and check out what they can find out about that source of information. And only when it passes those tests do they come back and look at the page itself and start to evaluate the evidence. So basically, that is the a priori ability that competency we must teach. They also tend to use reputation as the basis of epistemic trust. They trust something because it came from their friend, or they trust something because it came from a community that they're engaged in. And they distrust things that come from people that they don't know. That is not the criterion you should be using to establish trust in science. Okay. The criterion you should be using to establish trust in science, I'll come to shortly, uh, uh, are something that you need to know about and to be taught. And the last point, as I've point made, you need these because we are epistemically dependent. We ha all the time, we have to make judgments are based on our trust in expertise. For instance, I suspect most of this audience, in fact, I hope all of this audience, believe that climate change is an anthropogenic effect. Next question I will ask you is, how many of you have actually read the evidence? And I suspect if you're like me, you haven't read the evidence, and your trust is based on something else. OK, this is another piece of evidence to show that uh, the problem. This comes from Sam Weinberg's research. Uh, it just, I think, illustrates it. As researchers have shown, such claims despi persist despite the 2019 national survey of 3,446 high school students that revealed major deficiencies in evaluating the credibility of online sources. 
52% said that a Facebook video claiming to show ballot stuffing during the 2016 Democratic primary elections, a video that actually came from Russia, a fact easily established by searching for a 2016 voter uh, fraud video, constituted strong evidence of US voter fraud, yet 9 out of 10 students were unable to come up with a cogent rationale for rejecting the video. And that's posing a threat to our democratic societies. And it, that, I think, is a basis of the concern that most of us actually have. So this group considered this and said, well, what are the kinds of issues that matter? Uh, and how, uh, if these are the issues that matter, what can we do about them? And basically, we came up with this list, uh, essentially, of things that we thought were important. Digital media literacy, the kind uh, of things that uh, Carrie's talking about. Valuing truth, uh, that I think is something which we have to imbue into science education, that this is an important value. An understanding of uncertainty, uh, the role of expertise in making judgments, the kinds of errors that we all as humans make when we reason, and we do make them commonly. Uh, how you establish credibility in a source, uh, how we establish reliability and trustworthiness of scientific knowledge, what uh, cons consensus is in science, how it's achieved and why it matters, and then this kind of social and collaborative nature of science. And basically what we're arguing for when we come to our third, answering our third question uh, is that there needs to be a much more of an emphasis on the social structures in science that enable it to produce trustworthy knowledge. So, <clears throat> going on. Why science education? Uh, why, why can't this be done somewhere else in civics? Well, first of all, many of these issues are science-related. Uh, and if they're science-related, there's a kind of obvious inference that the context in which they should be discussed and how they should be decided should be in the science lesson. And science education okay, has a duty and responsibility, along with all other disciplines, to develop the competency to do this. You might say, okay, that in some senses, well, it's in competency is important, but you can't wash your hands of it and then say, we don't need to do anything about it. Because you're making an assumption that somebody else is doing about it, something about it, and you're making an assumption that they understand enough of what the, science, science, the social structures of science are to be able to educate their students. And I don't think they do. Because much of the information that's needed is essentially uh, science-specific. And these are the kinds of issues that you need to understand in coming to a judgment about a science-related claim. First of all, you need some kind of evaluation of science expertise. Who is this person or who is this body that is making this claim? In what sense are they, you might say, a benevolent source who are, is interested in advancing your understanding of the truth? Or are they offering you what you might call a distorted version of the truth? You need to understand some, some of the ways in which scientific knowledge is constructed and vetted to minimise error. That means some understanding of what actually is quite a complex process peer review, but at least a minimal understanding of how it works and why it matters. Most of all, though, you need some understanding of the importance of scientific consensus. Science is not a democracy where all voices are equal. What happens in science, basically, is that findings around a question accumulate over a period of time, and gradually, in fact, as more and more findings emerge, and that they all are saying the same kind of thing, scientific consensus emerges. And if there's a scientific consensus, if somebody's calling that into question, they can legitimately call it into question, but it's really, in fact, they're putting themselves uh, you might say, beyond the boundary of what all other scientists think, and they may, the, whether their information should be credible is highly questionable. And you also need to have some kind of understanding of the role of error in science. Science does make mistakes, but it's also got these self-correcting mechanisms for eliminating error. So these are the kinds of things, and that, I think, answers my question. Those kinds of things should be taught in science. Where else would they be taught? And therefore, we as a science community have a responsibility to do that. The other things I think in some senses, the last thing I say is important, is that we need to build some kind of sense of intellectual humility. 
Many of the ideas that we put forward in science are enormous intellectual achievements, just from the idea that day and night is caused by a spinning earth. After all, if you look out the window, it's patently obvious that the sun moves, to the idea that you look like your parents, because every cell in your body carries a chemically coded message about how to reproduce you. Now, these things didn't emerge overnight. They weren't the result of some kind of simple experiment. They were a result of years and years of thought and hard work. And when confronted with scientific claims, that needs some kind of understanding of what's gone into it in that kind of way. OK, so what can be done in science education then to develop the ability to evaluate scientific information and expertise competently? And this, is, I think, is obviously... Uh, you might hopefully come with me to say, well, okay, maybe science education should do something about this. But what can we do after all? We've got enough on our plate already. The curriculum's absolutely full with, with too much. Well, I agree science curricula are full with too much, uh, and that is an issue which science curricula have, I think, failed to deal with in what you might call a coherent manner for a long period of time. Uh, and all I am doing, I think, uh, and I think legitimately doing, is saying, for once, you really do have to think about this because your failure to do anything about this, if you're involved in science education, is a failure to science. And scientists out there themselves have to do something about it because they are worried about the lack of trust in science. So these are the generic kinds of things that we can teach with simple exercises over the, over the years, one of them is lateral reading. This is the idea that when you land on a page, okay, what you have to do, or if when, you, when, you, or when you click restraints, the other thing, when you do put a question into Google, you get a list of sources. Uh, what the sources you get depends upon what question you put in. And therefore, okay, the thing that comes at the top isn't necessarily the, the best thing to answer it. So expert fact checkers do not click on the one that comes at the top straight away they read through them looking for the one that actually might be the most useful before they click. When they get onto that page, they don't spend long on it because the first question they're asking is, is this source trustworthy? And therefore, they leave the page and do searches looking at the source and seeing what they can find out. They use, for instance, Wikipedia to establish whether there is a scientific consensus. Wikipedia is good when there is a... a significant uh, uh, issue which lots of research has been done on. So look at the issue obviously of masks, look at the issue of climate change, Wikipedia will give you good answers uh, to uh, your questions on that. They use fact-checking websites, Snopes.com, Sourcewatch.org, which spend, have professional fact-checkers in that sense and they'll use those to check out uh, sources. And the reason you need to do these strategies rather than some of the existing checklists that exist. Uh, there's a notorious one in the US which goes by the uh, uh, interesting acronym of CRAP, which stands for Currency, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy and Purpose. And the research evidence shows that if you use that, you'll still be deceived by duplic duplicitous information. So we have to educate students in these techniques. So those are the generic techniques. What do we have to actually do in science? These are the things we have to teach them about. We have to teach them about the importance of scientific consensus. Science puts a premium on intersubjective agreement. When there's a consensus, okay, basically science moves on saying it has established knowledge beyond doubt. It doesn't mean that it may not be called into question, that it can, can be called into question, but basically the, over, the body of evidence is so overwhelming that nobody's really calling it into doubt any longer. And that you need to understand. So one lone voice in the wilderness calling into doubt okay, is not really worthy of your attention. Ten lone voices in the wilderness, then it gets a little bit more interesting. But, but in that case, there's not a consensus. And if there's not a consensus, then in some senses, the best thing to do is to keep an open mind uh, in that kind of way. Uh, as um, Christopher Hutchins uh, said, uh, that can, which, which can be asserted with evidence, without evidence, can also be refuted without evidence. And so evidence is tremendously important and the consensus of evidence is tremendously important. You need to have some understanding, as I said, of peer review and the mechanisms 
of vetting by peers which go on. This is uh, quite important. You need to have some understanding of scientific expertise and what it means to be an expert. And in particular, you need to understand that somebody who is an expert in one discipline of science, for instance, radiology, is not an expert in epidemiology. And therefore, they have no legitimate expertise to question other scientists outside their discipline. This is tremendously important because this technique of calling science into question using scientists who have no expertise in the discipline has been used by the tobacco industry, by the oil industry, uh, uh, and um, I can't think of the, uh, and the uh, climate change deniers, okay, as well. And uh, you need to understand that. There are other people who have other relevant expertise because they work in the field, they midwives, okay, uh, from that point of view, or farmers or fishermen. They are people who have expertise built out of experience they could be listened to. But these are the things that uh, you can teach in science. More specific science elements, we need to attend to the teaching about uncertainty. Uncertainty is an intrinsic feature of science. And nothing, we can never be absolutely confident about anything, but science has ways of minimizing uncertainty, from the very basic stuff of taking averages to the much more complex stuff of doing statistical measurements about probabilities. There's a distinction between cause and correlation, and you need to be wary about those two and how those are abused and we need examples of their abuse. And then there are these errors in human reasoning that we make, uh, particularly confirmation bias is one of the things that we look for sources that confirm our views, and we don't look for sources that challenge our views. That would be true about, I'm afraid, a lot of politicians as well, but it also happens in science. Intellectual humility is something I'm, uh, I'm, I'm conscious I really just want to whip on, and I, uh, I uh, will not read that long quote from that point of view, uh, but I think the main point I want to make here is that there is a distinction between knowledge and information. Information is something you can get out of Google. Knowledge is something you need to understand it. Knowledge is based on a coherent network of interrelationships that you understand. And that is built up over time. And yes, that's something that science education attempts to achieve, but there are limits to what we can do in the time that we have. And that you need to be aware of that distinction and have some recognition of the fact that we are flawed as human beings, we make mistakes, and therefore we should not believe things without evidence. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, I'm afraid, because of the time, but this is a problem in the American uh, uh, curriculum, uh, which obviously doing this work in America, we do have to refer to that from that point of view. But I think this is also true to some extent of other curricula as well. So let me come on to um, finish with the policy implications. Uh, uh, and I need to be blunt about this, I think, in some senses. The things I've been arguing for are tremendously important. They are the competencies that all citizens and all scientists require. And because they're important, I argue that they have to have priority over teaching things like Ohm's law, the chemical structure of benzene, or the distinction between chromosomes, chromatin, and chromatin. Those kinds of pieces of information are unlikely to be useful again ever in your life unless you happen to be a practicing science in that scientist in that particular discipline. The things I'm talking about will be basically useful for the rest of your life. And if that means sacrificing some of what you might call the, the shibboleths of a current science curricula, so be it uh, in that sense. It means, I think, from a policy, you, science education needs to try and offer a more social perspective on science. Uh, how it functions as a community. Uh, that's something which it f uh, fails to do at the moment. Uh, it needs to put flesh on the bare bones of what is practice ache in the next generation of science standards of obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. That is not done well. Uh, in the next round of PISA, there will be a new competency called research, evaluate, and obtain information for decision making and action. And this is something that will be assessed in PISA. Uh, and it's clearly something that any next iteration of standards hopefully should attend to. This is the argument that we're trying to make. Uh, it means uh, educating science teachers about uh, what, it, what needs to be communicated and why it matters. Uh, I mean, all of what I'm saying basically uh, will fall on stony ground if somehow or other it doesn't get through to teachers that this is something that needs to be done. It means a focus on error, uh, and that means, I think, a shift in assessment. Rather than getting students to reproduce the right answer all the time, 
we need to get them questions which ask them to spot the flaw, spot the error in this particular piece of reasoning. Because only by doing that do you, I think, get people to be more circumspect about lots of information that they're actually getting. So that's a rather kind of brief run-through about this kind of report that we're working on. I, I think many of you might have seen a summary of it. Uh, we are hoping to produce the full thing with a much more extended argument uh, in the next three months, and I will um, offer it for a wider circulation there. But I'm very happy to answer any questions, uh, and I hope I've given you a sense of what the work we're doing is and why I think it matters, and hopefully you think likewise. But I'm happy to answer your questions.